Welcome to the Raytown Area Chamber of Commerce May Membership Lunch. I'm Loretta Hayden. I'm the chair of the board of the Raytown Chamber of Commerce, and my husband and I own the Luffy's Fried Fish here in Raytown. Welcome. I'd like to ask everyone to please stand for our invocation and our pledge. Heavenly Father, first of all, just thank you for allowing us to be here this evening, my Father. Thank you for the food that's been prepared and been digested. May it be nourishment for our body, moral for our bone. Bless everyone that's in attendance this afternoon. Bless our businesses. Bless our government officials. Bless the whole community of Raytown. I'm asking you to please continue to be with us, guide us, lead us. These things we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I would like to acknowledge our elected officials that are present today. And just to let you know, the elected officials which are part of the panel this morning will be introduced later. So first of all, we'd like to uh, introduce or uh, acknowledge our city officials in attendance. Mahesh Sharma, city administrator. Steve Mock, Alderman Ward 5, and Mayor Pro Tem. Michael Lightfoot, Alderman Ward 5. Pat Ertz, Alderman Ward 4. Charlotte Nelson, Alderman Ward 3. Chief Jim Lynch, Raytown Police Department. Matt Mace, congratulations Matt, Fire Chief. Did Matt stand? Okay. <laughs> Fireboard. Bob Palmer, Fireboard. Thank you all for being in attendance. We'd like to move to the Public Water Supply District Number Two Board of Directors, Jim McClanahan and George Yoakum. Did we miss any city officials, public water supply? I don't think there's any school district members, board members that are available today. If you're here, please stand and we'll acknowledge you. All right. I'd like to call uh, Mark Smith, our chair elect, to the podium now for our new members. Thank you, Loretha. And uh, Matt, in Loretha's defense, there's a pretty bad glare coming from, <laughs> from, coming from that, that direction. Uh, anyway, it's my, uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce five new members here at our Chamber of Commerce Luncheon. Uh, so I will introduce you, and then as we're talking a little bit about your business, if you would come on up here, and we should have some uh, uh, welcome packets for you. Uh, first, we have Brian's Car Care, and that is Brian and Peggy Johnson. Uh, their mission is to provide customers with the highest quality of automotive service and products with honesty, integrity, and competitive pricing. They're a Mr. Tire dealer uh, featuring American-made Cooper and Mastercraft tires as well as other brands. They're a full-service auto repair and experts in diagnosis, and they are family-owned and have operated in Raytown for uh, 22 years now in the Raytown area. Okay, next we have the Heart of America Council of the Boy Scouts of America, James Arcano and uh, Anthony Escobar. Uh, James is the district executive for the Thunderbird District. In, two, in 2013, the Thunderbird District served over 3,900 youth in the Raytown, Lee Summit, and Cass County areas. The youth had a registered total of 22,331 community service hours. That's 22,000 
331 community service hours, including 143 Eagle Scout projects completed. And thanks to over 2,000 volunteers, our communities have more leaders, more involved students, and better citizens thanks to the Boy Scouts of America. Welcome. All right, next we have the Mission of Hope, Hope Clinic with Michelle Williams. They are a neighborhood safety net clinic providing medical services for the underserved in Jackson, Cass, Wyandotte, and Clay counties. They provide dental services, which is important because poor oral hygiene is adding to the health risk for, for uh, compromised patients living with chronic illnesses such as diabetes and high blood pressure. In the process, and in the process, they are expanding as well. The expansion will double their capacity of the clinic and add optometry services to adult patients. Patients at this time, children vision services are offered through a partnership with Advanced Eye Care of Raytown. Michelle, welcome. Good to see you. Okay, and next we have Auto Service with Alan Auto. Auto Service is your Honda Acura service specialist. They are no nonsense when it comes to repairs and chargers. They use only genuine Honda and Acura parts in most cases. They have an extremely quick turnaround time, and he says no catches here, just quality service and repairs. Alan, welcome to the chamber. Do we have anyone from Sutherland's Lumber here? You want me to go ahead? I'll go ahead and introduce them. Okay. Uh, Sutherland's Lumber is also a new member, although we were hoping one of them would be here. Uh, they are family owned and operated. I think we all know who Sutherland's Lumber is uh, since 1917, and they are headquartered right here in Kansas City. A uh, wide variety of home improvement items and services for your home, yard, and farm. They specialize in building packages like homes, barns, garages, and decks. And with their Friends of Family loyalty program and their PLUS charge card, they have several ways to save lots of money by shopping at Sutherland's. So we welcome Sutherland's to uh, our chamber as well. Okay, next, uh, I would like to thank our legislative sponsors for today, our 2014 Legislative Luncheon, AT&T, KCPNL, and MGE. We very much appreciate your sponsorship of this luncheon. It's one of our key lunches every year, and we couldn't do it without you. So, so thank you, KCPNL, AT&T, and MGE. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce today's luncheon sponsor, which is the Bordner Events Center. And Christina Calderon, I think, is going to come up and say a few things. Christina? Hello, we'd like to welcome you to the Bordner, um, a place that I'm sure you've driven by many, many times and not known that this fabulous installation company also has this wonderful hidden gem of an event center. The space is available for social events such as weddings. Um, receptions as well as corporate events um, such as the luncheon we're having today. We do offer open catering so um, you have your choice in, in who you have cater your event. We can seat up to 350 so we have the room divided today to create a smaller atmosphere for us but we can use the whole space for up to 350 guests. So you do have some information on your tables there um, and a little barcode down here that'll take you to our website. There are pictures online, um, pricing, our preferred vendor list, and all of those things. So we encourage you to take this um, slip of paper with you and just check it out a little bit when you get home. And uh, we'll be around this afternoon. If you have any questions after the luncheon, I'd be happy to answer them for you. So welcome, and thank you for coming today. Thank you, Christina. All right, next on the agenda is our main event, our luncheon program, which is our annual legislative update. Uh, I'd like to ask Madeline Romulus and Michael Lightfoot, our Government Relations Committee chairs, co-chairs, to come on up and get this thing started.
right, hello everyone. I am Madeline Romius, Regional Vice President with uh, External Affairs with AT&T, and I have the pleasure of co-chairing the Governmental Affairs Committee with my colleague here, Alderman. I'm Michael Lightfoot, Alderman for Ward 5 in Raytown, Missouri. I also have the pleasure for co-chairing this committee, Government Relations with Madeline, so she's teaching me all the time, so this should be good today. Okay, so everyone, we are thrilled because all of you are here and we have quite a few pretty phenomenal elected officials here with us today. Those have been introduced and those who have yet to, we've yet to introduce. I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So we have, we're going to have a panel that's going to be a combination of state elected officials, county elected officials, and we, we're honored to also have um, a, a a key director for um, our federal elected official, Senator McCaskill. We're going to have three major topics today. We're going to talk about education, we're going to talk about transportation, and we're going to talk about tax reform. Um, these wonderful individuals represent not just Raytown, but also, because the school district is so expanse, also the school district. Um, and also we have leadership in the house with us today. Thank you. I will get started with the introductions. We'll start off with Crystal Williams. Crystal Williams is our Jackson County 2nd District at Large. She was elected to the Jackson County Legislature in 2010. She's the Committee Chair of the Intergovernmental Affairs. She also covers the Raytown as well as the school district. Next, I'll introduce Bob Spence. Okay. <clears throat> Bob is a Jackson County legislator for the 6th District. He was uh, elected to the legislature in 1998, vice chairman in 2006, committee chair of the Public Works and Rules, and he covers Raytown as well as our school district. Well, sure. Next, I'd like to introduce Corey Dillon. Corey Dillon is the Senior Regional Director for U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill. She's been with Claire McCaskill since 2001. From 2004 to 2007, she was the Executive Director of the Missouri Democratic Party. Claire was the first woman to be elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Missouri, which was in 2006. Thank you. I know your, your agenda lists quite a few state representatives. We had some people who had personal emergencies who could not join us today, but what we're extremely excited about is we have three key people here with us today. Our very own Representative Tom McDonald, um, state Rep, District 28, representing most of Raytown. Um, Representative McDonald was elected in 2008. Um, he serves on five key House committees. Um, he co-sponsored 38 bills in the 2014 session, and um, he's just pretty phenomenal. He's been very supportive of the Governmental Affairs Committee, and like I mentioned, I think from a geographical perspective, he has about 90% of Raytown. So, Representative McDonald, thank you. Okay. Representative Bonnie Mims is here with us today. She um, handles the uh, 27th district. Um, Representative Mims is a, is a freshman um, in her first term. Um, she was elected in 2012. Um, she serves on nine committees, and she covers um, quite a bit of the Raytown School District, Representative Bonnie Mims. And 
and last but not but not least, and I, I want to make a special mention of this representative because we're very honored here in this part of the state to have leadership here. Um, and many of you may not know that, but Representative Mike Sirkoy, um, state representative representing District 30, is the Assistant Majority Floor Leader for the U.S. House, elected to office in 2010. Um, in that capacity as Assistant Majority Floor Leader, uh, Representative Sirpoy is an ex officio member on all the House committees. He chairs the Special Standing Committee on Student Achievement. He vice chairs the Leadership for Missouri Issue Development, um, plus eight other committees. And I have a note here, although we're, we're that you also represent some of the Raytown School District, Mike. So thank you all for being here. So before we, before we go to our three questions, I just want to make a mention that we've got three different perspectives here today. We have state, county, and federal, and each of those different entities will probably approach questions and topics from a different perspective. And some of these topics may be more um, under the purview of one particular entity than another. But what we're going to do today, and Mike's going to tee up the first question is, we're going to ask a question, but we really want, if possible, um, um, each of you to try to talk to that a bit and speak to that a bit from your perspective and just your thoughts. Um, we've got about, I think, 20 minutes today, so we're going to probably maybe take about, you know, a little bit, eight to nine minutes per question. Of course, if things get kind of rowdy, and one question is very exciting, okay? <laughs> which happens, which happens during these things, then we'll kind of do some little give and take and we'll go from there. All right, for our first question today, we'd like to discuss tax reform. So on May 16th, there was a historic um, tax cut made in Missouri. We believe this was uh, vetoed by the governor, but yet it was overridden back in the house. And I think it had support from both parties. Can we get your thoughts on what the effect will be on this for our citizens and what it means? Representative Sirpoy, would you start us off on that one? Uh, 
health, but it wasn't indexed. We've indexed it now, so that might be a bigger part. Going forward, that $9,000 mark will go up with the cost of living over a period of years, which would be very helpful for working families. Thank you. Okay, well, it's true. The uh, 6.5, 6 or 6% um, tax rate is going to be driven to 5.5%. Um, takes effect in 2017. Uh, the bottom line effect on general revenue is about $650 million from um, the amount of money available to use for services uh, in our state. Um, at a point in time, and we're already that exact amount short on school funding formulas, we're going to double that uh, amount because the <coughs> services standing to lose the most are probably education and uh, services to see some of the other things that are the easiest to target. Um, the bottom line analysis for the people of great time were medium income working families uh, with an income of uh, 35, 40, 50 thousand dollars. They receive a benefit of about 35 dollars a year as the tax savings, um, as your earnings go up, obviously your savings go up, you get into the, six, the high six figures is pretty substantial. So it's really targeted for wealthier citizens, the higher uh, strata of uh, um, <coughs> The other side of the coin is we're saving we're getting a tax break of $35 for the majority of the people in my district. But yet yeah, we're coming back exactly behind that the same year and asking people to raise their sales tax by three quarters of a cent so we can pay for services that we can't afford yet today. Um, there's something inherently wrong with that. If you save $35 on your state income tax and then you, and you make Forty to forty-five thousand uh, dollars. Preliminary indications are that you will pay in uh, sales tax with a three-quarter percent increase, more than double what you're saving. So it's uh, contradictory and uh, really not saving at all. So uh, I voted no on, of course, the, uh, the sales tax. Uh, it didn't. Uh, Hold up, it's going, to, it's going to move on. And uh, um, I think in 2017, true, there are some triggers building that would say that if, uh, revenues are increased by $150 million. But uh, immediately, out of general revenue, it comes $650 million. So that's a shortfall that first year. Pretty hard to recover, but we're still struggling to pay um, for the basic services, especially education. You know, it's going to be a billion two at that point, and education will be the last thing that will probably be taken care of. So, with that, I mean, this is a topic we could go on and on for hours over. But um, basically, um, it's bad legislation, and I think it's unfortunately going to be a couple of years before it proves itself out. 2017, we developed, we developed <coughs> legislation that doesn't take effect. Until a further date, other legislative people or representatives will have to deal with that back um, from 17 on. So uh, there's been some talk that is really not constitutional, and I think it's going to have to stand a uh, uh, muster in courts before it becomes law. So I'll hand it down. Well, I see that we are properly segregated by members. <laughs> Actually, you chose your position. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I have to say, generally, I'm in favor of tax cuts all the time. I think politicians at almost all, every level of government will ask you for tax increases generally and then want another dollar on top of it. And I think with careful wisdom, common sense, that this very minuscule tax cut can be easily covered. We know that there's a 
lot of ways almost at every level of government. The further away from people you get, the more the waste. You know, I'm sure most city councils, especially in towns on our side, um, run a pretty close budget. You get to the county, it gets a little bit looser. You get to the state, it gets loose. And you get to the federal level, and it is really loose, as we all well know. So I have no problem with this minuscule tax cut. We can see how it works out in the next three or four years. If it needs to be corrected, I'm sure it will be. It won't surprise you to know that I have a tendency to disagree with my learned colleague, Mr. Spence, on this issue. Um, and I do actually agree with what um, Representative McDonald said in terms of what the impact on this on the state, particularly on education, um, how that impact is going to play out. I do, I do also find it intellectually incongruous that we basically have pursued a tax break for the wealthier people in the state while we're asking, asking for a tax increase for the working, the working folks of the state to pay what is in essence in the past usually been financed through user fees, um, which I think tells us a little bit about where we've now gone in terms of how we see equitable taxing structures. Um, since the other things have been basically addressed, I do want to bring up, which is not exactly the tax reform, but I don't know how many of you are aware in the last couple of hours of legislative session that we had a tax credit free for all. Um, that I don't know exactly what all of the issues were. I think Representative Sarah Poyer McDonald could probably be, tell us more specifically about what the tax credits went for. But there's something, I think we're going to have to be somewhat concerned unless this gets vetoed and um, sustained that that tax credit also, those tax credits also could have cost us, I think 500, is it 500 million um, through the long run. And it's kind of interesting because in the last couple of years, I've worked in the legislature as a nonprofit advocate, so I, I kind of get to have a front row seat and watch what goes on. But I think it's interesting that a couple of years ago, the, the clarion call in the Senate was to rein in our tax credit system in the state of Missouri. And then suddenly, out of the blue, in the last couple of hours of legislative session, we're now faced with what could also be a shortfall in revenue. That affects us on the, on the county and the, and the local levels through education. It also can affect us at the county in terms of the fact that we have assessment one of our most important jobs is, is to assess our homes and, and put a, a, a fair taxation on those. And that is actually an unfunded mandate from the state. Um, we are mandated to do it every two years, but over the last several years, the funding has actually been dropped from the state, and, and our level of service has been very difficult to upkeep. So those are things to be out the lookout for. Thank you. Hi there. So I represent Senator McCaskill, and her uh, her purview is uh, federal politics. So on this issue of the state um, uh, legislation that was passed, you know the truth is I don't know where she stood on it. I'm sure that she was opposed to it. Uh, I don't know all of the reasons why, except I will say that uh, what Claire has said all along, and as you know, she was state auditor and in her role as United States Senator, she's taken a very active role in uh, holding government accountable, making sure that tax dollars are spent like they should be. She was very active with um, the Truman Committee, which is her uh, uh, committee on government contracting oversight, otherwise known as the Truman Committee, to make sure that government contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan were spending the money like they should have been. So government accountability is near and dear to her heart. But she said while there is room for cutting some and while there is some waste, what we can't lose sight of is three priorities, education, infrastructure, and research. And there's no way that we can cut spending in those three areas first and foremost. So I think that that um, 
should shed some light on her position on that issue in particular. The first thing is the microphone last. <laughs> I don't know, that could be a scary part here. Well, I'm going to share that uh, as a person, I voted no on tax reform. I, I honestly went as the voice for the people, and I continue to be the voice for the people because they shared with me where the taxes were for the reform was built in, this is why I was uncomfortable, was for the rich and those that could make the six figures. When you look at our retirees, our working class, we're already struggling. We're just trying to barely come out of what you call recession. So when you look at where the tax base was, it's really hurting people in that class that's supposed to be, they say, the poverty level, which I think that's where I'm sitting at most of the time because the taxes, when I get my check, there's more taxes taken out than what I'm taking home pretty much. And when you look at how you retire, you've worked all your life to retire, you're still struggling because the taxes keep increasing on us. And so uh, as Representative McDonald shared on that side, and I'm sorry I said over here from you today, um, I hope you know, and I honestly felt like there's something that needs to be looked at. And every time I hear we need to fix, fix, where is there a fix when you cut? And everything that I stand for, which is education, we cut education, but we build in more prisons, we build in more correctional facilities. When I look at educating, when everybody talks about what education means, then it's not a top priority. So my top priorities are education, healthcare, and economic development. If you allow the economic development to start to grow, which is letting like businesses grow, allowing um, services into our areas, revenues to help out, then we will be able to look at a tax base. I didn't see that much wasting, and as I continue to look at the budget and break down the budget, oh yes, and I did that at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning myself. There were so many cuts in areas that are concerned that there was nowhere you could see waste, but you could see where the decline in the saw, where people were losing their homes. <coughs> people becoming depressed, needing health care, unable to have insurance. So when you talk to me about tax reform, first you have to get all those items. Look at where your people sit. Look at here what they're saying to you at this point. And so from the third and from the, well, I'm going to lower $25,000 a year to $50,000 because you know in order to get you some Medicaid or some assistance, you can't make over a certain amount of money. So that's under, do people know, under $25,000. Uh, how much is $4,000 a year? It's $4,000 a year, but then when you're looking at what you're coming in with, and, and believe it or not, there are people that are working that are eligible for assistance. And that's kind of sad. So I, I'm going to stop there and tell you, I was a no vote. I feel like that's something we need to look at before you start trying to pass something and, and talk about how it needs to be fixed. What we need to do is fix where our thinking is for our people. Okay, we appreciate all those comments, and that's probably the most exciting topic we've got. We're, we're going to actually allow a brief, a brief follow-up to the question because there are such varied opinions there, but when I say brief, I do mean brief because we have two other questions and we're short on time. So if we could, if we could start back at that end for a brief follow-up, if anyone would like to. If not, we'll just move on. Well, um, the only other thing I would like to add is there were uh, additional, there was a mention of additional uh, tax credits or exemptions. Um, there were five of them that uh, uh, went through the house, I think, uh, if you remember, uh, there was an exemption on the aircraft parts, <laughs> parts uh, that was to give uh, uh, incentive for companies who deal in the aircraft industry and maintenance and manufacture uh, to incentive to move into the Kansas City area. There was a, a discount or exemption on manufactured residential homes, which um, I really don't understand that. Um, there was an exemption for contractors who build uh, low income housing. There was an exemption for uh, contractors who do historic renovation. One short, but there was an exemption. Oh, an exemption on um, data centers to attract um, companies who compile and store data. So, 
there again, there's a use of pretty um, That's about a $300 million hit on um, uh, taxes, general revenue for our state. It's going to greatly impact the uh, rate down the grade to uh, about $2 million. Bucks. That's how we will not see it on general revenue. So. I just have a real quick comment. <clears throat> People, they've been very quiet and very nice. Last time I was here, I about got mobbed over the Sesame. <laughs> We're running a kinder, gentler function this time. Any other, just a quick comment? Does anyone have a quick follow up comment on that topic? Okay. All right, all right. Um, just a little heads up, Representative Mims, I'm going to kind of tee this one to you first. I don't, I don't want you to feel like we're starting there and we're ending here, okay? But it's your topic, so it'll be good for you, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about education, okay? So, Senate Bill 493, which I've got to give a nod. Representative Sirpoy, you were, was that the bill you were, you were a key author on part of that bill? You worked on that bill, so I don't want to slide anyone, but, but because of sort of, you know, due respect here, we're going to start here, but, but we're going to head that way. You know what? You got it. You got it. So it was the, I believe it was the Education Transfer Fix Bill, kind of controversial, okay, um, for um, our state um, with regard to unaccredited school districts and the families and the children that are impacted by that, and the other school districts. So with that, um, I'd love to know your thoughts on the bill. Um, what do you think are the, um, will be the outcome of that bill? Um, will it benefit our constituents here in Raytown, in the community, the state? Um, what do you propose that's different or additional? Um, any comments with regard to the passage of Senate Bill 493? <coughs> and um, its impact on quality of life here in, in Raytown. And you start with you, Raytown? Um, we will start with you, Representative Mills. Oh, Senate Bill 493 to me was insane. Uh, to me, I felt like it was an attack on the educational system. Excuse me. I was a strong, strong no. It wasn't a fix-it, it was kind of like a band-aid. Um, to me, when I look at MSEP 4, I look at MSEP 5, to me, it was pretty much a setup for school districts to fail. When you look at unaccredited school districts, um, when I looked at <coughs> Raytown, Kansas City, Dickman Mills, because those were my school districts. But when I look at a bill, I look at a bill for the state of Missouri, not just one area. The attack to me, that's how I took it, it was on Normandy and Riverview up in St. Louis' area. And Normandy, I got a chance four weeks ago to accidentally stumble on the Normandy School District, and I'm going to share my thoughts on that. I probably shouldn't, but I will. When I went to, I had my aunt take me to see it because I was there for another conference. When I saw Norman, the strange thing to me was across the street was heavy construction um, items, like machinery, just sitting. And my question was, what do you know about that school site? Because then I learned, as I continue to dig, that's a historical site. That was a historical black site, but you had a, a very diverse base in that school system. Because of the controversy of what was happening in Normandy got started and hit the news, if it had probably had, I think it would have been pretty much destroyed. My next piece was the Kansas City School District. So people need to look at whatever happens in Normandy and Riverview, Riverview is a domino effect, what's happening in the Kansas City School District. This is just how I, I'm just sharing from my view, and I'm a school board member. Those several districts were looking at not only being on the but looking at bankruptcy, when you're looking at the transfer situation in the school districts, for instance, say, I'm just, this is a hypothesis for me, Raytown versus Kansas City, and, kid, and I want to transfer my child. My child is coming from Kansas City, and the fee for that year is five to $7,000, and Raytown's is 10000 
that can transfer. You have that this district over here has to cover that. That money that comes is not enough to cover what all is happening for that child in that particular school district. But yet Ray Child has to pick that up and still carry it, which is this school district have to pay over here. This money is looking like it's going to struggle, and they're not going to struggle because they're going to lose money taking in kids that they really can't afford. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit on the educational piece. Why are we trying to let these children transfer to areas, even though we want them to have a great education and all the school districts have with them, those that are not unaccredited? But you want to transfer to places they're not going to be accepted, like they're walking. You know, you want them to get the best education, and they're struggling. Why can't we educate them where they are? Why can't we give them what it is that they need where they are? Why can't we allow those fundings? Every time you see a cut, it's education is the first thing that you cut. I'm going to get off on that because I will become a little more angry than I am. But my concern is, is it education or correctional facilities? Is it depression or suicide and homicide? I mean, that's just, if you look at what's happening, there's a trend. And just like the college student just after, Hold on his work, grab page at this point, and we're losing kids, we're losing folks in all different areas. So when I look at the educational piece, education is beat up. It's always the first to take a cut. So as I shared on the house floor, I don't get I, I, I don't care about this side is Republican, this side is Democrat. We are there for one reason. And we're the right bills that is the betterment of our communities, the betterment of our state. Not just all this calling about cut, 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 and fix, fix, fix. Get in there and listen to the people that are doing it. Do I hear most people calling with their superintendents? Or, and I'm going to stop and just no, no. Or talking to uh -huh. the educators that are in there trying to educate the children. So I'm saying to you, look at that deal yourself. Call your, your, not your constituents, but your uh, state reps, your, your senators. Share what your views are. Because I can tell you, when that bill hit the floor, I think my phone and my computer was blown up. And I, I have so many emails, and even and I'm trying to answer them back. They call it a sister bill, but to me, it was a teardown bill. Okay, Corey, before you, just for the, the, the sake of the audience, just a question to our representatives. Can someone just give us a, a high level of what that bill did? The path. Can can someone just talk to what was really the outcome? I know that Dr. Markley spoke with us, came to our committee. Can you just tell us a little bit about what the outcome of that bill is? Sure, I'll try to make them from others, but um, mm -hmm. the bill was was formed based on the law we have today. The law we have today says that if you reside in a district that's great and unaccredited. The children that reside in that district have the right to go to an adjoining district or any district in an adjoining county. And that's the rules we have today. There are three or four thousand children in the Kansas School District that reside in the Kansas School District today that go to Catholic, Christian, and private schools. If Kansas City is judged unaccredited, every one of those kids have a legal right to leave that school district and go anywhere they want to, as long as it qualifies by the lawyer rules. Those children are not on the formula today. That is tens or perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars that the fund is not paying for them. They, they, they're starting to be on the foundation for them. That is what they're trying to change. In Normandy, uh, just as an example, a thousand to eleven hundred kids transferred last year. Um, many of them, about 250 of those children, they don't know where they came from. They're in home school and private school. There's another 400 kids in Normandy that transferred that were in good schools within the Normandy school district. So our bill said, that not only do you have to reside in an unaccredited district, you have to attend an unaccredited school in that unaccredited district, and you have to attend it for a semester. And so, of Normandy's 1,000 to 1,100 kids to transfer, only about 250 to 350 would have qualified. It did a much smaller problem. It would have bankrupted Normandy, and it would have allowed the surrounding schools that absorbed some of these children much uh, a better ability to, to uh, control the number of kids that were coming to their school. Everybody thinks it's best to keep kids in close to home, and we do too. The bill also said that the kids that can transfer that are in bad buildings within unaccredited districts, their first choice is to, is to transfer to a good building within their district that is the appropriate grade level. And so that will take care of a lot of kids keeping them in the district and keeping that money in the district. Once those slots are filled up, 
children that have the ability to go, that we've established an education authority in St. Louis and Kansas City and the statewide one. That education authority will put intelligence with the child's best interest at heart and transfer them to a school outside the district. Either It can either be based on transportation or what that child needs, depending on the It also had a this is where the chair tell us about a small private option that said if a private school wants to avail themselves of these kids, they have to abide by all the rules that the state of Missouri has as far as testing and safety and health and all those things, but then they can accept these children. And that would be the cheapest option because the law right now says, I, I, I just put on I'm sorry. Right now, uh, in, in what's happening in Normandy and Ripley Gardens, the receiving districts around there are charging full tuition, they, what they consider full tuition of the receiving district. And that could go from Francis Howell about $10,000 to $12,000 per student to a uh, claim that's charging nineteen dollars to $20,000 per student. That's what's back in Ripley Gardens right now. Um, this, it, 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 St. Louis right now has a, from the old desegregation days, just like you had over here, they have a volunteer transfer plan in effect. <coughs> right now, claim take the net applies to the St. Louis City Public Schools and their surrounding districts. And a lot of kids transfer out of St. Louis City, voluntarily go to the surrounding districts. And the volunteer uh, tuition that the receiving districts are accepting is $7,200. This year, all the receiving districts could have opted out of that plan of $7,200, not one did. Which tells me $7,200 is not going to educate those kids. Claims right now, if they get a kid from St. Louis City Schools on the volunteer plan, they're getting $7,200. If they get a child out of Normandy, they're getting $19,000. That's just a And that's what you're trying to do is limit the number of kids that were transferred. The kids that did transfer were kids in, in, in struggling buildings, put them in good buildings, not bankrupt the city districts, so that just makes the problem worse. And give all the city districts the ability to control the number of kids that came. They could limit class size, student teacher ratio, all the things they need to do so nobody gets overcrowded, so nobody builds buildings, or has to hire classroom teachers, mostly teachers. As an example, Francis Town has received almost $5 million in this transfer. They have spent about six hundred thousand dollars on these students. That's just that's just what they're calling education Larson, 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 we're trying to put stop to that. Um, the governor's veto bill will have to take over by it next year, but that's what the intent was. And by the way, we've done a couple of education. Every, even through the 2008 downturn, we've always increased the public school budget. Okay, the problem is obviously um, public one supporting private education. Any kid can attend a non-sectarian school that they choose. Um, accepting school districts able to set of the uh, rate at which they will educate these kids. That's a problem. There seems to be no particular control over that. Um, the sending schools are responsible for paying that. Also, the sending schools are responsible for transportation, which creates a problem. It's going to end up with, uh, uh, leaving a lot of these kids unable to find a way to get to their new chosen school. So uh, it looks as if uh, the government's going to put a red line through this bill on the 30th. It's probably the best thing that can happen. It's going to stay in the last few months. Um, the problem I know is that. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, I'm saying this, this next statement, I do have my fingers crossed, but we do appear that we may actually be getting full accreditation by the end of this summer. And we are definitely going to get provisional accreditation because we have a superintendent and a school board that are solid and are committed and are moving forward and our achievement is showing it. In other words, We're doing the same things that the Raytown School Districts and the Lee Summit and everyone else are doing. Um, I can tell you, you know, 
my child goes to the Madden High School, and there, there are, just like any other district, there's better schools than others. We recognize that. As long as there are children who aren't gaining achievement, we're not doing our full jobs. But I also feel pretty strongly that we, I live in the city of Kansas City. We chose to live in the neighborhood we live in. We pay taxes in that district. And as much as I admire the Raytown School District and admire everything that you all have done, I think my kid belongs in Kansas City in the community where I pay taxes. So I'm sincerely hoping that as time goes on, we're going to be able to address some of these things. And I'm just going to say as a politician too, I have inherent problems with public money going to private institutions. I think it's a slippery slope. And I think that just like with the tax cut bill, and in some cases with this particular education bill, there are very many special interests that made sure that this bill said what it said. And that is, I think, very frustrating for any of us that recognize that we don't have the kind of funding that we can have our individual wishes carried out. And I'm not, I'm not impugning Representative Sirico or anybody else because I know he worked very hard on it. I'm just saying that there are parts of that bill that were were influenced by people that are completely outside of Western Missouri and they don't really care about us. So that's all I'm just. All right, thank you. Thank you for your, there are many, many views on this topic and, and as the county legislator mentioned, you know, there, I do know, and you all are aware that what we have at this point, despite all the different views, is a compromise and we just keep continuing to work toward a compromise. So thank you for your input. I think Mike, you have the final question. I do. Thank you all for that. <clears throat> the last question will be about transportation transportation funding and I believe there is a, a sales tax initiative at the state level so we understand there have been other incentives and different initiatives this year for transportation funding and could you give us an example of that and how it could affect the citizens we can start with Tom McDonald we start. well uh, in August Thank you. 
percent to support our kids in the state. And uh, I don't understand the balance or how this works particularly, but it just doesn't seem like a balance. Been supported, I guess. There's been four in the last few years. I believe three of them were a cent. We had one cent come to this year. The cent modified and brought it back into three quarters of a cent. I didn't support it because I don't think uh, sales tax, general sales tax, is the way to fund our roads. I think we need to do something with gas tax. Uh, most all states are struggling with this right now. Uh, gasoline usage, I know in my life, probably in yours for 20 years, we've been probably losing half the gas you used 20 years ago. And by the way, the, the gas tax is the same as it was 20 years. Six cent bump in uh, 1994 hasn't risen to cent, 17 cents today. Um, it's too low. Uh, primarily because we're using so much less gas. We have a lot of, uh, of these uh, battery cars, compressed natural gas is starting to come online. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to address in the coming, in the coming uh, years. Low dot is starting to death. Uh, asphalt prices, concrete prices, steel prices have all increased the last 20 years, and their revenues have been pretty flat. Uh, I, I didn't support this, but I, I think we need to look at gas tax or perhaps a sales tax. Just to put a regular sales tax on gas, we might be doing one down the number down the lane. Um, I don't know why the excise tax is historic, but it was brought out maybe for a sales tax just because the, it's much simpler to apply. But a sales tax would be just for inflation, too, which would be a, a much better way to go forward. Well, there's actually no doubt that something needs to be done to like we're going to make uh, infrastructure concerning highways, bridges, etc. I wish the bill was a little bit tighter. I'm concerned that this 80% that the state's going to control will also be used on things like airplanes, which in my view is not infrastructure. I, I would like very much to receive tighter controls over that money and, 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 and companion. Um, Subjects, and I'm sure this is of interest to great town people. Uh, but the town executive Mike Sanders has come up with another plan to try to get uh, rail transit going in Jackson County. Uh, the latest plan being that we do have an option to buy the rail line. I can't remember the numbers for sure, but uh, so don't hold them to me. But it's like 60 million, and he's got like 57 million um, targeted. Grant money from the Fed, which would leave us with three million to cover. I think, Crystal, maybe you can confirm or deny, but I think that that's generally the range that we're in. Uh, that's wonderful, except I hope that three million doesn't come out of the road and bridge when we've rated it enough already. But I'm sure that, that rail going through Graytown would be a big plus for this city. back a little bit on what Bob just said. I think that the rail initiative, though I know it's not strictly within the transportation tax, I've already told you what I think of that, so I don't think you need to hear it again. But on the rail, the rail plan does appear to be moving forward, and I think one of the things that's really exciting is it's Raytown and it's Lee Summit. And I think that we've got a lot of support from even like downtown Kansas City because the downtown Kansas City rails work better if we have our commuter rail also tying into them. So I love, one of the things I love is seeing the massive amount of cooperation amongst all of Jackson County and moving forward on this rail plan. I know that the Raytown community has been extraordinarily supportive, and I think we all should pat ourselves on the back, and so is Lee Summit, so is Independence. We should pat ourselves on the back that we've actually been able to work together on something that we could be moving forward on. Going back to the transportation bill, that was the question. I'm going to ask my colleagues on the next side, but I'm going to please because they're my seniors. So when it's something I'm not sure about, I feel pleased, even though you say Democrats are the minority and Republicans are the majority, that I, can, I feel comfortable with going to either new area when I have concerns and discuss them and be allowed to share my views and come back. I, am, I was very supportive of the transportation bill. 
Bill. My reason for that is because I believe in infrastructure, economic development, and that to me is revenue. We got jobs here at home that builds up our revenue. So when we took it at all the tax cuts that we have, if we bring in money in, companies and build and businesses in, then that builds up our revenue. Then we won't have to be cutting so much. We don't have to worry about cutting our education. We don't have to worry about vouchers and private schools coming into the public systems, and then they stay for a semester, and that money follows them wherever they want to go. I didn't like that part. So when I look at transportation, yes, I did support it because I look at, as I said, infrastructure. So those are the things that I guard when I talk about what is the need for the people. Our other thing that I'm pleased about is I'm having to learn from Raytown about the different ordinances that you all have that are different from what Kansas City has. Some of those hinder what Raytown's needs are and that where you want to grow. But also Raytown is growing, but I also learned another piece, that people come to Raytown when they want to um, shop there, you know, minor cases. It's cheaper to get out of court with those type of cases than it is because of the way that the ordinances are designed. So I'm learning, I want you all to know they're learning where all we got our folks from the city council meeting, but I also want to look at the, the transportation piece of bring right down my glass. And I'll speak from the federal perspective on three points. One, uh, Senator McCaskill has been very supportive of the commuter rail project um, and has facilitated numerous meetings with the Transportation Secretary in Washington and local <coughs> officials here uh, to make sure that they know from Claire's perspective it's a top priority. The second thing is the Highway Trust Fund is going to go broke by the middle of uh, the summertime. Uh, for exactly the same reason, it's uh, funded with gas taxes and people are buying less gas and so uh, we have less money than we need. So that's going to be something that Congress uh, wrestles with this summer. Uh, and the Federal Transportation Reauthorization uh, Bill will also have to be uh, dealt with this summer and it, it expires in September. So uh, we did a two-year reauthorization a couple of years ago, and Claire was disappointed with that. Uh, she really believes that we have to figure out how we do the transportation budgeting uh, for multiple years, at least five years. And so she'll be working toward that and hopeful that we can start reaching some uh, hard decisions, making some hard decisions uh, on what we do to deal with uh, the funding shortfall and the opposing need to uh, support infrastructure. All right, thank you, Corey. Wow, three big topics. Each of these topics could have been a luncheon within themselves, but I think you'll all agree that before you, you've got six individuals who we are very thankful, regardless of what side of the fence you're on in an issue, the integrity of these six individuals who represent us, who support our key um, senator is phenomenal. Let's give them a round of applause for being here today. Okay. I know Vicki's giving me the look because we're over, we're over, but the members of the Government Affairs Committee, can you all stand? I wanna thank you all for being here. These are the folks who get together For that, I strongly invite and encourage you to join us. We meet, what, the, we meet monthly on Fridays, and um, Vicki sends out a notice on the meetings, and the type of topics that these wonderful public servants have spoken about today, these are the kind of topics we grapple with. So if you didn't stand up, and you've just got an hour of your time on some Fridays, please join us. With that, I'd like to thank you all for, for doing your thing. Yes, Representative. Yes, ma'am. My colleagues on the other side are being quite humble, but I want to share a few things that it took all of us to do. And that's HB 2010 and 2011, which serves on the appropriations of health, mental health, and social services. So, Representative Searboy, I just want you to be, um, I want you to smile for a minute. For, for Jackson County, Cass, Clay, and Platt, there's a crisis unit that's coming to our area for uh, veterans, homeless, 
folks with drug addiction and mental health issues. It is a $4.5 million project with federal match dollars of $6.7 million that passed through the House, the Senate, and came back and passed. So that is one thing I want to share is that it took all of us to pass. Secondly, we did a renovation. It was a bill for renovation of the municipal courthouse in Jackson County. That one also passed. So we have some good infrastructure pieces that did pass that I want to share with you all. So I have to say, as a freshman, I diverged to my seniors over there, and uh, they made it happen. They made it happen. They brought it to the table, and they helped me make it happen. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, we appreciate all that. It's been a great time. I'm going to hand it back over to Laretha now to uh, tie it up. All right. We'd like to thank everybody again for coming out and be a part of this panel. A um, lot of good information. Um, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit real quickly about our Each One which Reach One Drive. It ends this week. So I challenge you that if you have not brought anyone in to still do that. And while our membership drive is will be ending on the 30th, we will still continue to uh, reach out and try to bring one member in for our Each One Reach One campaign. That's a 2014 goal. It's for each member of the Chamber of Commerce to bring in one new member. So I challenge you to still continue to concentrate on bringing in your one member. Um, calendar of events, I'm just going to uh, ask you to... We're going to do the... Oh, the drawing the for the new members. Okay. Yeah. So All pick, right. pick an item. This is for Midland, two executive level seats. And it will go to Don Merker. Is he still here? We'll get it to, we'll him. Get it to him. Okay. Pick an item. This is for a $20 gift certificate to Luffy's Fried Fish, the best fish in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Williams. <laughs> this is a um, four points, $25 gift certificate to Boulevard Bar and Grill. And it goes to Renee Perte. I think she had to leave. Funhouse Pizza, one large pizza. And it goes to Pat Ertz. Pat's been working out. This is the Royals versus Mariners um, game on June the 20th. Pat Ertz again. <laughs> This is um, a wonderful uh, packet for from Advanced Eye Care. They have some really neat shades in there. You guys have to look at mine. I have a pair. Um, and it goes to Patterns again. <laughs> All right. Please look at, on the back of your uh, itineraries for your for our uh, calendar of events. Um, we're not going to go over each one of those, but just a reminder that the uh, Rotary Golf Tournament is coming up this end of this week. We're going to have our business card drawing because we're losing people fast. Business card. This is the spot business spotlight, and it goes to Community Support Partners Michelle McGraw. Okay, and then uh, Jarrett, I think he had to leave with Allstate. De Jarrett uh, Devereaux with Allstate um, received a little goodie bag. Little goodie bag. And then um, Brenda Howard, First Federal Bank. A piggy, is that a piggy bank? A piggy bank. Thank you all so much for being patient and for staying. We'll see you next month. Thank you.